Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live daily photo show on YouTube every weekday morning, 9.30 a.m. Pacific, unless it's today, in which case it's 10.30 a.m. Pacific. A little bit of a late start. Had some other stuff to do this morning. I was actually at my local Chamber of Commerce greeters meeting, and it, which was hosted at our local uh, Ashland Fiber Network hub offices, our local ISP. And it's kind of a homegrown ISP. There's a whole history there that's kind of cool. But uh, it was there, and then I got a little tour of the facility afterwards. Already posted some pictures to Instagram. But if you've been into these things before, I know for some of you guys out there, John, this is totally normal. But it's just kind of cool to see inside of the server rooms and whatever they're called and just getting some pictures. Look at my Instagram. Instagram, uh, photo Joseph on Instagram. You can see a little, little story in there, a little mini story. A cool place, though. And I was talking to them about my speeds, and they're like, mm, maybe we'll get you a little faster. We're talking about maybe... See what it would cost, but I might be able to get gig, gig fiber into this building. We'll see. We got to see where the nearest switching station is and what it would really cost. But the main guy was like, yeah, we could probably do that. <laughs> That'd be cool. Okay. Uh, today's show is a, is a pickup from what I was doing yesterday, not on the show, but yesterday for work. I did a real estate shoot and it was just one of those where, um, Initially, I thought it was going to be kind of a, it's, it's a bigger house, but it seemed like it was kind of a normal, just a normal, simple shoot. And I got out there and went, ooh, this is a really nice house. And so uh, we talked about it and kind of upped the ante a little bit. And um, normally I've told you before when I've talked about real estate stuff, which incidentally, uh, we'll link right up here. I've done photo moments about shooting real estate before and specifically about shooting in-camera HDR, which is a really, really effective way to do HDR on the cheap. This house is almost a $3 million house, so we needed to do a little bit better than that. So we did, uh, I did, I shot normal bracketing and just kind of went between three, five, and seven stop bracketing depending on the environment that I was in. And uh, so let me just talk about that first. I mean, there's nothing really to show on this, although I, I guess I could show some still pictures of it. Um, I did bring in the Lightroom library. I'll show you some of these. But uh, I set the, you know, I've talked about doing the custom functions before, the C1, C2, C3. And I thought I would just share how I kind of did this yesterday. Because I was, since I wasn't using my patented HDR, instant HDR look and swapping between the custom functions there, I was doing it manually. And I ended up saving that into one of my C3 settings, overriding what was originally there, because I decided to shoot video as well. Now, the client doesn't actually know that I shot video. So I had that new Manfrotto tripod that I did the unboxing for a week or so ago. Up there. Uh, did the, I brought that tripod. And the only reason, ironically, that I brought that tripod is because the tripod that I would normally bring, which has the head that I've shown on here before, where it's got three knobs and I can really very meticulously adjust it for you know, tilt and yaw and pitch, <laughs> uh, get that thing exactly level, which I really like for real estate. It makes it really easy to make everything perfectly even. The video head is not as easy to do that with, but that tripod with that d -d 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 head is in production for the GH5 training, and it's like there's no way I'm moving that tripod because it is a locked shot. I ain't moving it. So I brought the video tripod. I know I don't need to go vertical, so um, you know I figured it'd be fine. And then since I had it, I go, ooh, after I got through a few rooms, I went, ooh, you know what I should do? I should do video as well. And nothing complicated. I didn't do any slider shots, but I just did pans. Uh, for every still shot that I did, I then also switched over to 4K, 60p, 8-bit, and I didn't bring the Ninja and do 10-bit external. Let's, you know, let's not get carried away. Although that would be useful because interiors, exteriors lit, lit quite differently. It certainly would have been a good place to do 10-bit, but okay, let's get carried away here. So I shot it in 8-bit. I wanted the 60p so I could do slowdowns if my pans were too fast or I just wanted to smooth them out or whatever. Um, but then I was playing with a new tripod head, right? Because this is the new head to me. I've, I've not had a tripod head of this video caliber before. The Manfrotto, now I don't remember what it's called, but yeah, again, it's already linked up there. I did the unboxing. And uh, took a little while to kind of get the hang of it. And at first I was doing it, I'm like, I'm not really getting very smooth pans. And then I remembered, okay, wait, hold on. If I tighten it down, so there's a little tension knob on that, tighten that down quite a bit. And then I was, it's a much more resistance for the pan and it was getting much smoother pans. Like, oh, okay, it's starting to figure this thing out here. Nice, really, and they're called really smooth shots. So, uh, so I'll show you some of those video shots that we did. And this is gonna be a combination thing when I show you the videos of the panning smoothness as well as this really, really cool feature of this lens that you're gonna to wanna to see. So we're gonna to come to that. Uh, but let's start with some of the still stuff. So let me bring up my Lightroom library. I'm just gonna show a couple of things that I did here just to kind of share the experience. Um, one, of the, one of the things I do when I do real estate, I've talked about this before as well, is I put my camera on a painter's pole. I have a painter's pole, which I then mount this ball head on the top of that. I got a little adapter to attach 
this to the painter's pole. Uh, I know I've talked about that in a video before. It's one of these links up here. It's somewhere in there. Um, mount the camera on the top of the pole. The pole is, I think, a 16-foot pole. And then, of course, I can hold it up higher than that. So you can get, you know, over 20-foot reach by just holding the pole up. And normally what I do is I would link my iPhone to the camera Wi-Fi and then I'm moving it around and I'm getting the position so I get that kind of aerial shot. I call it my you know cheap aerial or whatever, budget aerial. Get the aerial shot without having to fly in a drone and uh, get the picture. And then this way I can shoot raw, I can shoot with the lens that I want. Anyway, so I do that and I'd fire it off. I was having troubles for some reason. I don't know why. I got to go back and I didn't, just didn't want to screw around with it. I was having troubles getting the Wi-Fi app to stay connected. So I just said, all right, I'll come back to this later. I'm going to go back to the old way that I used to do this. And the reason I'm telling this whole story is because even if your camera doesn't have the Wi-Fi capabilities, there is still a really cool way you can do this. You know, I've been showing you guys the um, time-lapse mode, right? So I put the camera in time-lapse mode. I scheduled it. I set it to shoot a picture every second or maybe two seconds. And then to shoot 20 pictures or 30 pictures or something like that. So I've got the camera down on the ground, get it all set up, point the camera at the house and hit the autofocus, make sure it's focused or manual focus, whatever, just focused on the house. And then push the button, it starts taking a picture. Boom, boom, boom. And while it's doing that, then I raise it up in the air and I did tilt the LCD down so I could see it, although it's full day, bright sun day, it's like, I can see it, I can barely see it, but you know, kind of enough to get an outline. I can kind of see where the house is and I'm just moving it, you know, click, turn a little bit, click, tilt it down a little bit, click, tilt it back a little bit, click, and just fired off a whole bunch of shots that way, basically in the hope that I'm gonna get something good. So after the 20 or 30 shots that I tell it to shoot, pull the camera back down, quickly flip through them. Okay, yeah, now let's change this, let's change that. And so that's how I did it. So you can do that on any camera that's got a built-in intervalometer, which is pretty cool. So let me just show you those real quick, just so you can see the, the actual experience of that. So that's, there's your house, you know, when it's still laying on the ground, right? We haven't quite picked it up yet. And then here it is getting up to height and let's try to level that thing out. And there we go. Now we're starting to get level. Nice house, right? So trying to get level. And obviously a lot of these shots are not gonna be good. So I'm panning to the right a little bit, you know, let's tilt it up, tilt it down, maybe pan, okay, maybe pan that way a little bit. And then it comes back down. Okay, so I look at those shots and go, mm, okay, those are kind of okay, but walk around the house, there's a pool on the other side. So let's try and get that in there. So let's get this up and get that up there. So I get there again, shot, shot, shot. It's just shooting automatically. I'm moving it around. And at some point when I bring it back down, I realize I didn't even get the stupid pool. Oh, there it is. There I got the pool. I must have moved. So there, there, there I've got the pool in there. And now this is probably one of the shots. It's probably the shot that I use for the hero thing on this card, actually. Uh, and now I've got, you know, a nice aerial, quote unquote, air quotes, aerial shot of the house. I'm shooting raw. I'm shooting with the high resolution camera. So I've got all the pixels that I need to make the adjustments and it comes back down again. So Pretty cool there, I guess I did one more. Oh, there's the one that I actually used for this. So you see, you get a variety of shots this way and it's super easy to set up and do and super cheap. Obviously you don't have to buy anything extra as long as your camera has an intervalometer, put it in there, stick it up on a pole, tilt it around and off you go. And this isn't just for real estate. It's just one of those things that you can do. You ever wanna get a high up shot of something? Do it that way. If you don't have the Wi-Fi control, it's not available, it's not working, whatever, put it in the intervalometer, stick it up in the air, tilt it around, get the shots. That's it. Pretty cool, right? Pretty neat little technique. Um, oh, Ryan's confirming for me. Thank you. The the tripod head that I was using that I'm talking about is the Manfrotto Nicrotech N8. N for nitro. Uh, so there's that. So I want to show you that. And then let me see if there's anything I wanted to show you in the uh, in the house for stills. I don't know if there really was. It's just, I shot HDR. I just shot bracketing. So now I'm going to run these through HDR software. I'm probably going to use MacFun's HDR because it has a really cool batch processing. What I'll do is I'll bring in a a couple of samples and um, and come up with a recipe that I like and then just batch them all out there and then obviously I can tweak each one later if I need to. But that's probably what I'll end up doing. Beautiful house though. If you've got three million to spare and you want a house that has a private library, uh, well, I, uh, library, office, call it an office, a, let's see, massive living room. Let's see, where's the living room? This thing, massive is probably the wrong word, but just here, check, check this thing out. Beautiful living room with all kinds of natural light, big fireplace. Um, this is the best part. Look at this. Let me, it's a historic house. That's really cool, but let me see here. Get down to the art studio. There's a whole art studio, a separate building. Here we go. With tons of natural light, big vaulted ceilings, and a separate office. This is a whole separate building. So if you want to live in Southern Oregon and you got a few million to spare, um, buy this house. <laughs> it's kind of awesome. <laughs> and it's got a barn. It's got a full-on barn as well. Let's see, where's the barn? Uh, here we go. Here's some of the barn. Got a big old exposed, like, you know, half open. I don't know what you call it, but a big old barn in there. It actually even has, look at this, horse stables. 
Cool, right? So if you want that sort of thing, check it out. Um, okay, so pictures, still pictures. Like I said, pretty straightforward. Bracketing raws. I was adjusting it between three, five, and seven stops. A uh, seven, yeah, three, five, and seven stops. Always one stop apart. Doing a bracket that's like a third of a stop under, over. It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense if you're shooting raw. If you're shooting JPEG, I guess that could make sense. But shooting raw, you can easily tweak. Uh, you know, a couple stops either direction. So, I one stop apart is the most the camera will do. So minus one, zero, plus one, or minus two, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, or from three all the way through. So seven stops of variance. Again, just depending on the scene. If it was really dark interior with a really bright, you know, full-on sunlit outdoor, then I'd go for the full seven, which even that's overkill, but whatever, you may as well do it. And then if you've got uh, a scene that's not as much variation, you take it down to five or just three stops. So that was kind of cool. Okay, so that was the still side of it. And then like I said, I did video. And I told you that I didn't tell the client I was doing video. I did it as a um, surprise. I, I, did it. I did it because I wanted to test the panning head. I didn't want to commit to anything. I hadn't even talked to them about doing video. Um, I did it because I wanted to test the panning head. It's all there. I may as well just do it, right? So I switch over to my other C setting. I did C3-1 and C3-2. So it's just touch on the screen to switch between the two. And um, I wanted to test the panning head. And I figure I'll take the video, if it turned out, and it did, it all looks great. I'll take the video, I'll build together a really simple little montage of that, put some music on it, and then offer it to them for an additional fee. If you, if you would like this video, you can pay this extra money to have it. If you don't want it, then that's fine too. You know, you've already paid for the still pictures and we're good there. So a little extra thing. I think that uh, that can be helpful. You know, it can be a nice little add-on to add to your clients, uh, to offer to your clients. Um, you know, and you're not getting paid by the hours. They didn't care if, if it takes you longer to do the shoot anyway in the first place. So, so there you go. Okay, so there's that. So then with the video, I told you I was playing with the panning head, but there's something else, a little secret about this camera and this lens that I get to tell you about. But before we do that, let's see, is there anything in the comments here? Um, let's see here. Is that a, yes. John Morby says, I've used 6K photo and start stop mode at the end of a long pole to do something similar with hippos. Oh, perfect. There you go. That's a great use for 6K photo as well. All right. So you could put this into 6K photo mode. He's by start stop mode. He says, he means that you push the button to start recording. You push it again to stop. So it's just like shooting video. You're in 6K photo though. So you've got 18 megapixel four by three aspect ratio stills that you can extract from it. And you just take that camera up on the pole, raise it up there and tilt it around and do your thing. Very good, very good use of 6K photo, uh, absolutely. Oh, something else that came up. Um, remember at one point I talked about, probably when I did was doing the HDR thing, I talked about using the self timer on the camera and setting it to just the two second self timer, just so that you have time, you push the button, you have time to get your hands off the camera, let it stop shaking if there's any shake to it before it takes the picture. You don't need the full 10 seconds, the two seconds is plenty. And someone suggested that you could use the shutter delay. There's a feature in the camera where you can say, delay the shutter, so when you push the button, it waits a second, I think it's between one and 10 seconds that you can set it to. And I, I heard that comment in my head when I was set it up, and I thought, oh yeah, you know, I'm gonna try that because I've never done it before. And I set up to do it, and it does exactly that. But here's what happens. So I was doing these auto brackets, the, the, um, yeah, the auto bracketing. You push the button once and it goes and it takes all seven pictures, five pictures, whatever. When you build in the delay, it puts in that delay between, before every shot. So if you put in a two second delay, it's gonna go two seconds, take the first picture, two seconds, take the next one, two seconds, take the next one, which I didn't want it to do. I wanted to wait two seconds and then have it go and take all the pictures. So that two second delay or that built in shutter delay um, is active for every single photo. So that's a huge difference between doing a, a, um, a self timer on there versus doing that delay. So just something to keep in mind. So if you want to do a, a bracket, an exposure bracket, and you want time in between shots for whatever reason, that's where you can do it. You can set up that exposure delay in there, which is pretty cool. Let me just show that to you real quick. Um, I didn't set any of this up, but it should be, where's my, where my cables go? Oh, it's right here. Let me just plug this in real quick and I'll show it to you. Cause I, I thought that was quite, quite cool. I never played with it before. Like I said, the comment had come up in here as a suggestion on how to do it. And, uh, and I went, oh yeah, let's try it. And there was the result. So let me set this thing into regular picture mode. Um, there we go. It's showing up on the screen. So go to that and let's see here. I think it's under the cameras, the shooting mode here. Probably two, 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 two. Our system stability, stabilizer, burst rate, okay, photo. Uh, time limit, silent mode, shutter delay. There we go. Shutter delay off. So you can go one up to eight seconds. So if I set it for two seconds, so that's set. And then I go down and I do a bracket, which is uh, actually hold on. I've got this in my saved settings because I do it a lot. So let's go to bracket. Go up to exposure bracket. We'll do a five 
five shot sequence. And remember this button here means that it's all gonna fire off automatically. So now when I push the button, oh, it's electronic shutter. <laughs> so you're not hearing it. Oh, and there's no memory card. Well, just trust me on this one. I got a memory card in there. It's electronic shutter. It's, you're not hearing anything, but that's what it would do. So it would delay between each one. So, so there's that. Okay. Uh, let's see here. That's the only comment that's on there related. Remember, if you got comments that are related to what we're talking about, throw them in now. If you got comments that are not related, either throw them in now and don't forget you did and remind me or just hold on to them and we'll bring them back afterwards. Let's see here. What I want to show you today. Let's remember the podcast. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, please do. It's more photo fun stuff. This is the photo apps podcast where I bring in a guest from some software company somewhere in the world and we get to talk about their software. The last one was Cinemagraph Pro from Flixel, which is super cool and fun. The whole process there, the whole thing you're doing is you take a, a movie, a short movie file while the camera's on a tripod ideally, and then you look at that movie file and you say, freeze this part of it. Let's use that frame for this part of it and then let the rest of it animate around it. And one of the coolest ones that I saw in that podcast that you'll see that the, my guest showed was a, a pond, uh, pond, lake, pond, with you know nice, nice rippling, little winds rippling, you got people walking in the background, the trees are swaying, and there was a bird flying across the pond, and he, he froze the birds. You've got the pond, and a bird froze in midair, and everything around it moving. Oh, that's just so cool. Oh, that's a really effective use of it. Lots of fun stuff, so check that guy out. It, it's a neat, uh, neat little app for sure. Okay, let's, uh, any other questions? No other questions. So remember the questions, you want to put them in there? In the meantime, let me tell you the secret of the camera that I'm holding back on. So this lens, this is a, this is, as far as I know, it's this lens, which is the 12 to 60 Leica. I don't know what other lenses have this yet. Um, if, if, if this is a, in all lenses that's going to have this going forward, I do not know. All I know is that it is in this lens. And what it is, is a smooth aperture ring opening and closing, but only in auto mode. So here's, here's what's happening. You know that if you change your aperture normally, if you were to change it while you were shooting video, let's say you put the camera into manual exposure mode, and then you're going to pan the camera from a, a dark room to a brighter part of the room, or, you know, indoors to outdoors, whatever. Your exposure needs to change. If you were to roll the aperture dial while you're panning or while you're shooting, you would see steps. It's going to go a little bit brighter, a little bit brighter, a little bit brighter. You see these steps in it. This is why cinema lenses, true cinema lenses, have stepless aperture. So you can change the aperture. It doesn't step. It's very smooth as you move the dial manually. But on all these cameras, when you move the dial manually, it goes step, 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 step. So that's no good. But what I learned was that if you put the ISO, uh, put the aperture into auto mode. So if I put, I put it into cinema mode and I went into shutter priority, so I locked in my shutter. I then also locked in my ISO because I didn't want the ISO to change. So the only thing that could change by the camera was the aperture. And then I did my panning from dark to light. The iris closes or opens, in this case closes, smoothly. And you get a smooth transition from light to dark. That's new on this lens. This is pretty slick. So let me show you. I've got a few videos here all fired up and ready to go. Let's see here, all on the timeline. Yes, we are, we're ready to go. So let's go over here. We're in Final Cut now. So this first shot, and I'm gonna go full screen. By the way, these are 4K 60 8-bit. They're playing off of this little Thunderbolt drive here. So I'm gonna try playing it back full resolution. If it stutters, I'm just gonna drop the quality, which should still look just fine on the 1080p, but what's more important than seeing the quality of the image is seeing it smoothly. So uh, so if, I, if the quality drops, that's why, because I went and switched. I mean, I'll tell you I'm switching it, but anyway. So let's go back here. So this first shot, let me uh, turn off the sound on this as well. You don't want to hear any of this. Um, yeah, we'll do that and mute that. Okay. This first shot is uh, me doing it manually. So you see what happens if you step it manually. So this is the interior of the house. I'm doing a pan. This, by the way, is before I really figured out the panning head, so it's not as smooth as it could be. So there, as I'm closing the aperture down, you can see the steps, right? So we're trying to go from the exposure from the inside to outside. So clearly that was terrible. So now we do it again, almost again. Now we do it again. And this is now in auto. And I set it to um, a spot meter on the center of the scene. And so you see how smoothly that changed, but it changed too late, right? It changed too late. At that point, it changed very smoothly, but it didn't change until, well, until the center spot 
meter point, which was in the middle of the screen, until that got to the middle screen, and then it started to darken. So then I moved the spot point over to the left side of the screen so that it would start to darken as that window came into frame. And that's what this last, I think the last one of these is. Um, and then I got another, another environment to show you. So let's try this one. So now we're doing a pan again. And I realized there's the blinds there. The blinds didn't open properly, so we had to leave them closed. Um, so we're not like seeing a really beautiful outdoors. So there, there, that spot was off to the side. So maybe an ideal position would be somewhere in between. Kind of it, it came down, it came darker a little bit too quickly. And there you can see it coming back up again. And it's a wider pan. But you see the point is here that you see how smoothly that's going. Okay, now I just went too far. It's getting ridiculous. Okay, I'm going to stop that. Let's go to the next shot. So this is, again, playing with it and playing with the position of the spot point. Where do I put it? And basically, wherever I put that, whether it's the center of the screen or off to the right of the screen, is going to determine how quickly it's going to go dark as we go over the, uh, the bright windows in there. So there you can see it kind of went down and went back up again as we panned through. But again, the whole point here is we're seeing it very smooth, a very smooth uh, exposure change. So here's this inside of the barn. So here, this one, I think I had the spot meter point back in the center, so it's kind of late on the drop. So yeah, it's late and it wasn't getting dark enough. So then I think the next one, I probably darkened the whole thing a little bit. Tried this again. I might have moved the center point. Let's see. We'll know in a moment here. Looks like I slowed down the pan there. So there you go. There's a pretty good smooth transition. That's actually, that one worked out really well. So you get that transition from the interior to the exterior very smoothly. The exposure is perfectly dropping down without any steps, without any noticeable steps. And the difference in the timing here is purely based off of where I put that spot meter point, whether I put it more centered, more off to the right, or so on on the scene. So that's what each one of these different shots is. So this is a huge, huge benefit for anyone shooting these type of environments where you've got a much darker, much brighter, you want to adjust the camera, um, and uh, you want to adjust the camera, pan the camera rather from part one scene to the other and uh, maintain a valid exposure. So that is what that was all about, which I think was really cool. Now Trevor says in here, I see a comment come up. Trevor says, I can understand wanting a fixed ISO, but typically I'd use auto ISO for this application. Works really well. Yeah, so the reason that I didn't want to use auto ISO, and, and clearly there's going to be a difference, right? If you do auto aperture, then your depth of field is going to change. Now in this environment, uh, if it changed it's not enough that I've really noticed it. I mean, I haven't super pixel peeped it, but it's not the kind of thing I don't think the client would notice for sure. Uh, but I was more concerned, well, for one, I wanted to show the iris changing smoothly, so I was recording some, uh, purely to show that, specifically to show that. But also, if you're changing ISO, you might be going from a really high ISO to a really low ISO, so the whole image might go from really grainy to really clean if you're going from a super dark to super bright interior. And I was, I'd rather have my depth of field change on this because especially at this distance, the difference between being wide open and stop down halfway is not gonna be that big of a difference in the depth of field. Probably not gonna be noticeable, especially remember the camera is moving, there's other movement in there. More important to me is the exposure change, but it's creative decision, you can go either way. You can also make the shutter speed change, right? You can make the shutter speed change while you're doing this and that's perfectly fine as well. Different options to do it, but what I wanted to show you specifically was that you can do it with the aperture now on this camera with this lens, which is just incredibly, incredibly cool. All right. Um, okay, we got a Jakartan's got a GH5 question. We'll hit that in the commentary afterwards. That is what I wanted to show you on today's show. That's really all there is to it. Pretty simple, straightforward stuff. I think it's really, really cool. Um, I'm really excited about that, about this capability in here. And I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to be in all the lenses in the future. Like I said, I, I just, I don't know. I just know that it's in this one. Um, APN TV is asking, have you done much work with variable ND filters? Yes, absolutely. That's, yeah, I should have like started, I should have opened with that. That is your more traditional way to do this sort of thing. You get a variable ND filter. As you rotate the filter, the scene gets darker, brighter as you let in more or less light. And that way you can keep your ISO, your shutter speed, and your aperture all fixed and locked. Clearly, you're doing it manually as you're adjusting that. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, and yes, I absolutely have worked that way for sure. In this situation, A, I didn't have it with me. B, I wanted to show this. But yes, variable NDs would be the traditional way to do that. Uh, yeah, so there's the answer to your question. Okay, that's it. That's it for this part of it. If you want to stick, if you want to see the commentary, if you're watching live, stick around for that. If you're not watching live, at the end of this video, you'll be able to click on the commentary video and jump straight to that. Uh, with, that is, with that said, you know what to do. If you like the video, thumbs up it. If you don't, you don't have to do that. But you can if you want to. You can thumbs down it. But tell me why. Tell me what's wrong with the show in the comments. And with that, it's time to get out of here. See you guys later. Bye-bye.